If you're a visitor and not familiar with uh, preparation for Bible study, let me quick run over it with you because we're about to take part in the Eucharist and you want to be sure that there's no unconfessed sin in your life if you're a believer. By a believer, I mean, by a believer, I mean that you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, and upon that fact and that fact alone is your salvation. If you believe that, then we encourage you to participate in the Eucharist. You're more than welcome. We have an open communion to all believers. But we request that you be sure that there's no unconfessed sin in your life when you take part in the Eucharist because it has a disciplinary clause in it, which we'll discuss with you today. And then for Bible study, you need to be under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 says that the Holy Spirit's indwelling ministry, one of many, is to teach and recall the Bible studies that you learn. In other words, the word of God that you put in your soul by faith, the Holy Spirit is able to bring it into the experiences of your life, and not only your life, but in the lives of others through you. Uh, so you, you learn the word of God by the Holy Spirit's ministry, and you exercise it in the same way. So we're going to take a moment for you to be sure that you don't take part in the Eucharist in carnality or study the word about God in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Evidence of carnality, like in 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, evidence of carnality is personal sin. How do I get out of carnality, walking in the flesh, and back into walking in the spirit, which is the, is the whole purpose of sanctification, walking in the power of the spirit? How do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality? Listen to me, 1 John 1, 9. One of many passages is one we use consistently around here because it says, if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you that sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That word cleansing was used in verse 7 of 1 John 1 for your salvation the work of Christ on the cross, i.e. his blood, cleanses you. But, you know, we sang, used to sing this old hymn. We still do around here. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. So when you come to salvation, that blood works for salvation or justification. When you come back as a believer with personal sin in your life, like mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and overt sins, you come back to the cross as a believer and confess your sins, and that blood that brought you into salvation cleanses you, brings you into spirituality or sanctification. So confession of sin is not for salvation. It's for sanctification. It's for the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. So we want to be sure you do that um, before we do, do part in the Eucharist, and we're about to do the Eucharist. Um, some people, we call it Eucharist because it's a Greek word meaning giving of thanks. It's used twice in reference to taking part in the Eucharist, and many churches call it the Eucharist. They understand the Greek order of it. Others call it the Lord's Supper. They call it communion. There are a lot of great names for it. We just call it the Eucharist because of, of the giving of thanks. It's a grace word, and uh, so every time we get a chance to promote grace, we, we do that. So let's, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll take a look at 1 Corinthians 11. We'll take part in the Eucharist. Uh, Rick, we, are we prepared to do the Eucharist? Okay, be sure. Be sure. I know William will take care of me. Um, let's have prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed will offer you, offer you privacy in your priesthood to make confession of sin. If you confess, he forgives. When he forgives, you are cleansed. It restores you to the sanctificational ministry of the Holy Spirit. Well, Father, we thank you today another opportunity, another day to be alive on the earth for ministry, 
to be able to share our faith within our own experiences of life with other people. To realize, Father, what an enormous journey you've put us on as a believer in Christ over the years of our life. And each month we come at the first Sunday of the month to celebrate as a great proclamation of our life, our faith in Jesus Christ, that the love of God sent him to the earth and the love of God in his heart sent him to the cross. And that love of God and love of Jesus Christ is what brings us and attracts us to the cross. And when we accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our salvation, that love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 5.5, 5. thank you, Father, for that verse. And we are the epitome of that work of God's love in our life to other people. We come to celebrate what a wonderful event with our feet on earth and our heart in heaven to take part in the Eucharist. It is a reminder of our responsibility and our duty to Jesus Christ to be his witness on earth, to carry the gospel through Moody and St. Clair and Alabama and the United States and uttermost parts of the earth. We want to be that obedient people, Father. Today we take part in the Eucharist to proclaim that to back to you. We are your people. We understand our mission. We will be faithful until you send your son. And so, our Father, we thank you today for the grace that you've given us today, not only for our church body, but those who are visiting with us. And for some new people, especially Jeff and Amy and the family, what a wonderful thing it is, Father, to be rejoined with them, uh, locking in lockstep with the mission of great ministry. We're so thankful for that. Now, Father, we turn our attention to the Eucharist, the celebration of what Christ provided us through grace. You provided a perfect body and he kept it perfect. You provided a perfect blood and he kept it perfect. We enter into that perfect union with him through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How thankful we are today, Father, for that grace program. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourself, it is a gift, a wonderful gift, a gift that keeps on giving through our lives to other people. Thank you for Willie, how you've brought him so faithfully to us and how he carries that message uh, to Moody and throughout St. Clair County so faithfully. We turn our attention to 1 Corinthians 11th chapter today in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 11th chapter. Well, we will take part in the Eucharist today. I'll explain it, then the men will come and deliver it, pass it out. We start with verse 23. Never had anybody walk the aisle that quick. That's quite a thing. He walked the wrong way, though. He walked, <laughs> well, anyhow, verse 23. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the night and was betrayed, he took bread. The same message that, that Paul delivered to the Corinthians, I deliver to you at Grace Valley that in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. See the words, and when he had given thanks, that's the Greek word for Eucharist. It means good grace is what it means. 
an attitude. You come to the Eucharist with a great attitude about the grace of God. For it is by grace you are saved. Right? By faith and not of yourself is a gift. So when we come to the Eucharist, we celebrate that idea. And that's celebrated in the word giving thanks. The idea of a healthy attitude, a healthy grace attitude for the Eucharist, which reflects the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So he talks about the bread first, and he, 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 he shows that the bread is broken is the body of Christ. Here's how he said it in verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it, the bread, and said, now the bread he broke was the Passover bread, which was shadow Christology of the coming of Christ, who would offer his body and his blood as sacrifice for our sins. He says, this is my body. He says to his disciples, they hold this Old Testament, Old Covenant cup up. And he says, a miraculous thing is going to happen to your life today. I'm going to teach you that this cup is going out and the new cup is coming in. The old cup is going out and the new cup is coming in. Watch how he did this. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The first, the bread represents the body of Christ, which represents this. It has to be a perfect atoning body for sin. 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 talks about that. That he has to offer a perfect body that can bear the sins of the world. His body must not bear his sins. It must bear others. To do that, it has to be virgin born. You know, Luke 1, the Christmas story. Luke 1, 30. Uh, Luke 1, 34, 35, 36, 30, 35. The virgin birth. Jesus has to be born outside the slave market of Adam's sin in order to redeem everybody that's outside to the inside. He has to, he has to be born outside Adam's sin in order to deliver those that are in Adam's sin. You know 1 Corinthians 15, 22. In Adam we die, in Christ we're made alive. He has to bring a body. It has to be perfect in the sense of redeeming man from the slave market of sin. We're all born into the slave market of Adamic sin. And so he, the virgin birth, if he's not virgin born, he's not a savior. They call it virgin birth. The truth of the matter is virgin conception. Birth. His body has to be impeccable. He lives 33, 34 years without sin. No volitional sin. It would be nice to have 30, 35 minutes without it. He has to be born. Listen. He who, listen, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See the swap? Do you see what's swapped out? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. You see the swap out? If he doesn't have a body capable of, there's no swap out. He takes our sins and we get his righteousness. That's quite a deal, isn't it? <laughs> you know how you got it? Grace. You could never earn that. You would never deserve that. And so that's an important feature. This, the, because listen, he says something. He says something really important to you. He says, what says? This is my body, which is for you, it, not me. My body was never for me. He says, this is Jesus. It's for you. Do this. Take the cup, take, eat the bread. Drink the cup. Eat the bread. You do this in remembrance of me, what the bread represents. 
Not only that, but the bread represents hypostatic union, a fancy, a fancy word in theology, which simply means that he's 100%, Jesus Christ in his humanity was 100% God and 100% man in one man. It's called hypostatic union. They had to come up with, it's a Greek word that describes that. It's a phenomenal idea. He has to be that man. He has to be that man. And listen, when he goes to the cross, he's got to be willing to empty himself of the God side of him to hang there for the sin side of man. Do you realize that? You should, because that's exactly the deal. And when you take part in the Eucharist, you should do the, you should take it in what? In what? That's recall. That's your mind telling you what the bread's about and how important it should be to your life. The other thing that we should, listen, Jesus dies on a cross, he's buried, and he's raised from the dead. In a, listen, he has a resurrection body, and he returns to the Father, and he is seated today at the right hand of God the Father. He is the head of the church, the savior of the body. He is the great high priest. He is all of these things. There's the, all these status privileges. He's a son, listen, that we get. He's a son, I'm a son. He's an heir, I'm an heir. He's eternal life, I'm eternal life. Do you see that? You know why? Because he was raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, and everything that he is seated on that throne, I become in him. He's a priest, I'm a priest. There's a little pamphlet around here you can probably find. It's called 50 Things You Receive at Salvation You Can Never Lose in Time and Eternity. And some of those things in there that you should pay attention to, there's a section called 20 Status Privileges in Christ. It's who you are in your salvation. You should read them and embrace them because that's who you really are. Did you know that? And you should live that life. You, you are given the Holy Spirit of God to live that life. You're a son of God, and you have the capability, the supernatural ability to live beyond your flesh capacity. Think about that. In this fleshly body, you can live a godlike life through the power of the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God. For example, when you got saved, he poured the love of God into your heart, Romans 5, 5. And not only is that for your heart, but it's for, it's for other people from your heart. You can love other people with the love of God from your heart. And when we take part in the Eucharist, we should be grateful for that. Eucharist. We should have a grateful, grace-oriented heart for the Eucharist because it identifies who we are in our humanity. Do you understand that? Well, you may have to do the Eucharist two or three times with us to get it. But I'm telling you, this is what Paul is talking about. So when you get that cup, I want you to reflect on those things. In your bulletin, there's a little... There's a little sheet that will help you with it, All right? You can look down there. Not now, you, but when it comes, you, when you take part in the bread, why? You can look down there and see what, what you should be remembering. You should take that home and you should study those passages so that this really does come from the heart the next time, not from a piece of paper. Then he goes on. In verse 25, in the same way he took the cup, in the same way means giving thanks. After supper, he said, this cup is a new covenant. When he says this cup, he's referring to the old covenant, the Passover cup, the Exodus 12 cup. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. 
not the animal blood of shadow Christology, which you could read about in Hebrews, the fifth chapter through the tenth chapter. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Listen, the blood that they used to carry into the inner sanctuary of the temple, into the holies of holies, and put on the ark over the seat of the ark of the covenant, for the day of atonement was, was a reflection of one day Christ would come, he would die on a cross and secure that for us. And let me tell you, the day of atonement was a big deal. It was a Eucharist. It was a big deal. The Eucharist, which we do around here every first Sunday, should be a big deal. If you're going to skip church for any reason, don't skip it on that day, because this is a big deal. What the Old Covenant was a big deal to the Old Covenant, the New Covenant is a big deal to the church, as opposed to the priest nation of Israel. And let me tell you, the priest nation of Israel well understood how important the day, the day of atonement was. And we, as the church of Jesus Christ, should understand how important the Eucharist is in our church age. Well, this is a cup of new covenant due to my blood, as if you drink it and what? Your mind should not be blank because we gave you a sheet with some on it. <laughs> Uh, and at some point we want you to transfer that through memory center into your heart because it is so important you know one of the first things we teach our kids other than their name their phone number and their address right we don't do that anymore no we give them a phone <laughs> You hit the button, it'll bring you home, kid. I guess I'm talking in my day. <laughs> That's what we did. And the kids told me the other day, my kids, kids sitting around the table talking, they were talking about their kids. My kids were talking about their kids. And we were talking about how we used to keep up with our kids. It was like a nightmare for me. We, barely, we, we just got telephone, you know what I mean? And uh, my, my kids said, I have no problem. I, I got something onto their cell phone. I, I know where they're going all the time. I, what, did I let the cat out of the bag or something? I don't know. <laughs> I went, poo, man, I would have loved that. I'd have played with that so much. I'd have gotten in trouble. In verse 26, for as often... We do it once a month. As often eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord. Watch that. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know how important, why it's important to come and sit in the Eucharist? Because it's a silent witness to everybody around us, especially to the devil and the fallen angels. What we believe, for, uh, what we believe in and what we stand for it's a proclamation. If nobody else, it is to the angelic world and the forces of invisible warfare. Whose side we're on. Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful day. You know, very often we get to stick it to the devil. But whatever chance we get, we ought to do it for sure. As often you eat the bread you drink, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread, now watch this. This is why you need to make sure you've got your sins confessed. Therefore, whoever eats, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. You know what that is? That's, ha that's willful sin in your life. When you, when you examine your life and you go like mental attitude sins. I don't have any that I need to confess. Any mental attitudes, sins of the tongue, overt sins, 
Buddy, if you don't have it, if your conscience don't convict you, the Word of God doesn't convict you, and the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you, you can't find anything. You take part in the Eucharist. But if, you're, if, you're, if your conscience convicts you, you confess your sin. If the Holy Spirit convicts you, you, can, you confess your sin. You understand? If the Word of God convicts you, you, you confess your sin before you take part in the Eucharist. That's what he's talking about. Now, you need to be careful with this. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner with, wilf, with willful knowledge of personal sin in your life, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. In other words, you're going to be disciplined. A man must examine himself, right? How would I do that? First John 1, 9, right? I examine myself if I've got no sin, if I'm not aware because you keep up with them. You should keep up with your sins. You know what? They, they keep up with you. But you should keep up with them. You shouldn't let them go a day a week. You should let them go a second. As soon as you're aware you did it, you should confess it. And then next time you ought to be aware before you have to confess it. Ah, well. A man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Listen, if you're here and you're a believer, and you go like, well, I don't know. Well, look, you just go, did, have I committed any mental attitude sins? Da -da 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 -da. Okay. Have you committed any sins of tongue? Well, I got one. Okay, well, let's get it out. You do it to yourself. Any overt sins? I mean, is this too difficult to figure out? No. I, I, I'm answering my questions now. A man must examine himself and do so, and he must, he must eat. You don't come to the Eucharist and not do it. But listen, you, you just, listen, I'm going to give you a moment. In a minute, I'm going to give you a moment. All you have to do is shut your eyes, close out the world, and examine yourself. Mental attitude, sin, sin is under very, and if, you, if you're aware of any, right? If you're aware of any, you do what? You confess them. You do it in silence. You do it right. What do you do? Confession is, means to name it, cite it, and agree with God on it. All right. I'm just telling you. For, and here's because the problem. For he who eats, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. How do you judge it rightly? Please tell me you know that. I'm going to come down there. First John 1, 9. Right? How do you judge the body rightly so that you don't take part unworthily? How do you do that? First John 1, 9, you confess your sin. It could be mental attitude, it could be sin of a tongue, it could be overt sin. Look. For this reason, for this reason, many among you are weak, sick, and a number of sleep. That's divine discipline. To part in the Eucharist, you go, I don't care what Ron says. I, look, you ought to care what the Bible says. I have said anything the Bible hasn't said. All right. For this reason, many among you are weak. Weak, sick, and a number sleep. That's a euphemism for dying, a Christian dying. If we judge ourselves rightly, how, how, how are we going to do that? <laughs> First time, one night, or confess your sin. Agree? Yeah. Huh? If we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. Because you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to do it yourself, right? You're supposed to judge yourself rightly. Isn't God wonderful? God said, listen, if you'll take care of yourself, I won't have to take care of it. But if you don't care, take care of it, I'm going to have to take care of it. I'm going to have to bring discipline on your life. This attitude you have towards my son's death as a believer it gives us a wonderful grace opportunity to confess your sin. Right? Step up the plate and do the, do the right thing. Encourage. Listen, it's a way to encourage God's heart today. Step up and do the right thing. You understand what I mean? Encourage his heart. Let him see a willful person that has been saved by the grace of God, has committed sin, and is 
willing to step up the plate and go like, God, I, 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 I did such and such. I want to take part in the Eucharist. <clears throat> he loves that heart of yours. Look at it. The heart that confesses sin is the heart for God because it's an obedient act. God loves that. I'm telling you, God loves that. If we judge ourselves rightly, we'll not be judged. When we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, and he talks about it in verse 30, weak, sick, number sleep, so that we would not be condemned along with the world. It shows when God disciplines you that you are a son of God and belong to him. So let's take part in the Eucharist. I'm going to pause and have a word of, we're going to have a word of prayer. You're going to do it silently. Bow your head, close your eyes, offer, offer you privacy. Examine your life, at least in regard to three categories, mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, and avert sins. If you're aware of any, confess them. Name them, cite them. And take part in the Eucharist with a, a clean, healthy, happy, thankful heart. A Eucharist heart. One that's so appreciative of the grace of God. And so, our Father, we, we thank you. We've instructed your people for the Eucharist. Wonder, wonderful thing in our church age. It's our national anthem, so to speak, of our existence as the church of Jesus Christ. Blood bought. Spirit indwelt. On one of the greatest missions God has ever given any group of people in the history of redemption. Go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Go to Moody, go to St. Clair, go to Alabama, go to the United States, and then go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Father, you didn't give a bit to a big one. You gave it to 12 guys who had expanded their ministry to 120. To a church like us. And we are thrilled to be commissioned with that. We will be faithful to do it. We will spend as little on ourselves as we can and we'll spend the bulk of it on reaching a world for Jesus Christ. We come to the Eucharist today with thankful hearts that we live in a, still in a free nation for the church. So much of the church is underground in the world. And if they're not, they're being persecuted unto death. We are still a great grace nation. We're still a great light to the world because of the church. Jesus is the light of the world, and where he is, there is a light to the world. May we be that light. May we be that light in Moody and St. Clair County. We're thankful to come once again, Father, still present and powerful to the Eucharist of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for this great privilege you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. The men will come. The first element we're going to deal with today
is the bread. This is my body, which is for you. The men will pass them out in a moment. We'll hold them and take them together. Rick, would you have the prayer over this? Father, thank you for your gracious plans you have given us in sending your son to, in his humanity to hang on that cross in our place so that we will have a final life in his obedience to your plan mm. that he loved us so much that he would fulfill your plan for us. Now, Father, thank you for all, all you've done for us. We pray this in Christ's name. And when he gave the thanks he brought, he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. William, will you pray over the cup? Father God, we thank you once again, Lord, for keep things remember, we pray. Uh, as our Lord and our Master, to Lord, remind us of who you are and what you mean to us. We thank you. Remind us of how you died on the cross for us, Mount Calvary, and shared your blood. We thank you. You're so merciful unto us, we ask. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. In the same way, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often drink it in remembrance of me.